Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, it's good to see you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Sunday. What is this that I'm holding in my hand? I thought, I thought you'd never ask. I'm just enjoying a delicious beverage from the Bayview Cafe pop-up that's going on out there. So if you haven't had a chance to taste this, you should get out there afterwards. It's fantastic. They're doing kind of a soft launch right now with the pop-up, and then it's going to be open to the public after that. But we're just, I mean, you don't have to go get coffee. We're just really excited. But go out and say hi. Um, and if it's your first time here, welcome. We're glad that you're here. I'll set my, my coffee down. I will get that. Don't worry. I'll get that before. But uh, I also have a connection card. So as you guys came in, you were probably given one of these connection cards. And it really is one of the best ways for you to get connected and know what your next steps are to take, not only in your faith, but also here. So if it's your first time, we'd encourage you to fill this out and then drop it off in the offering boxes in the back or meet one of our friends over at the New Friends area. So you fill that out, give it to them, and then they'll tell you some next steps to take. And as a way of saying thank you for coming and being a part of our, our church today, we want to make a donation in your name to one of our missional organizations, which is really, we want you to experience generosity in the same way that we have. And so we're so glad you guys are here. Thanks for being a part of it. Happy Sunday. I'm going to invite you to stand up as we jump on into worship. Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. We're so glad you guys are with us today. Me and so glad to, good to be in God's house when we get to worship our Savior. You're going to see people this morning lifting their hands, clapping. Would you join in with us this morning? Oh, we praise you, Jesus. Oh, we sing it out. Well, praise be you in the silence is the enemy. Let praise be you. Thank you. 
love to share with you, so would you take a seat? You know those big things in life? Marriage, family, kids, friendship, work, faith. They're so important, you carve out time to think about them because they make life full, abundant. But what about your money? Who do you talk to about that? You might have financial advisors, estate advisors, tax advisors, even culture telling you why money's important. But what if they don't have the full story? Like how money shapes your heart, shapes your family, shapes your life. How money gives us the opportunity to be generous. And how deep down we all know the beauty of generosity, how it transforms people and connects us to the heart of our generous God. For God so loved the world that he gave. How it brings freedom and joy. And how you've never really met an unhappy, generous person. And so it makes sense to spend time with people who love generosity, to think about it deeply and to talk about it honestly. But here's the problem, it's tough. Because most people who wanna talk about generosity seem to have an agenda. They want something from you. So who can you really talk to? Believe it or not, there are others like you who realize we need to talk about generosity more, not less. Because generosity is connected to the abundant life. So a few of us are gathering together. And here's the thing. It's all fully and privately funded. So you'll never get asked for money, ever. And this is really important because we all know that in order to be open and honest, it has to be safe. We don't assume to know what's right for you, only that God has blessed you and that your life is unique. But that doesn't mean you're alone. So here's our agenda. We want your heart to be captured by Jesus and generosity even more and create a place where you figure out what that means for your journey, and that's it. At Generous Giving, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. To go deeper and to experience a life that is truly life. So we invite you. Carve out one day this year to explore generosity with others like you. You're invited to a journey of generosity. Generousgiving.org. Well, if you're new to Northgate, then um, one of the things that we do in our services is that we spend a little bit of time each week talking about generosity for a lot of different reasons, but maybe even you got a sense from the video that you just saw is that it really is, it's a discipleship tool as far as what God is doing and shaping in our hearts. And so I wanted to introduce you to a new friend of mine. This is Brenda. Everyone say hi to Brenda. Hello. <laughs> it's okay. I do it every time and they're always so kind. And hi. So with that, um, so Brenda got the opportunity to actually experience the journey of generosity class of that, the, kind of the little trailer that you just saw up there. And so we wanted to bring her up to share a little bit about it because we think that it's an important part of who we are as a church. And so what made you consider like to even jump into that sort of a video or not, not a video, but to the class? Sure. I learned about the journey of generosity at the Remember event that was held in early March. And at the time I was struggling with an ask from God that one asked me to be generous beyond what I was comfortable with. Um, it was impossible to me, possible to him, but definitely impossible to me. And so as Pastor Larry wrapped up the event um, and spoke about gen journey of generosity class, there was this whisper from God to take the class. It will answer what you're struggling with. And, and good for you for leaving in a whisper, because usually I'm like, I'm sure that wasn't God. And then he gets louder, he gets louder. <laughs> Uh, so then you, you took the class in April. Yes. Uh, what was it? Was there anything that stuck out to you in particular from the class that you experienced? Sure. For me, it was the second video with Dr. Timothy Keller. And he mentioned that most people will say they don't idolize money. But it's what we do with our money that reveals our idols. And I was like, oh, okay. And within minutes, like, my brain went to a certain section of my closet. Like, okay, got it. <laughs> Well, and, and Brenda also shared with me, so she's newer to Northgate here in the last six or seven months. And yes. with that is that there was also an element of just meeting people and, and getting integrated with community as well. Yeah, it was nice meeting new people, connecting with people I serve with on the First Impressions ministry team. There's something super powerful when you start to share things that require a little bit of trust. All of a sudden you start to build some relationships with that. Yes, the class is small. It's like 12, 15 people in a small, intimate, safe space. That's great. So if somebody were to ask you, you know, why, should, why is it I should consider taking this class, what would you tell them? If you are struggling with an ask to be generous beyond what you're comfortable with, and it doesn't have to be a monetary con contribution. It could be time, your talent, maybe it's making meals for someone, loaning out tools, whatever you're being asked to do, I recommend taking the class because it will help answer those questions you have. 
And, you know, Brenda essentially said it. It's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. And so it really is a hard issue. Yes. And so we would invite you. We, we've done a couple of the classes. I'm going to put a QR code up there for, for anybody who might be interested. So, again, Pastor Ken was kind enough to run the class a few times. And because of how impactful it was is that we've said, gosh, it would probably be good to open it up to our, our church as a whole. And so if you're interested in taking the class, this doesn't sign you up for the class. It's just an interest list. Uh, and if you are one of those, uh, I'm sorry, QR what code, you can also take your connection card and put journey of, uh, journey of generosity on there, fill that out and drop it off and we'll be in touch with you. We'll let you know about when the classes are going to be coming. I think we're just at the point of trying to see what sort of interests there are and how many classes we need to do because Pastor Ken has been kind enough to say, well, We'll keep doing it as long as we need to. So with that, if, if that's how you want to step in or if there's other ways that we, that we can help you in stepping in in your journey of generosity, we encourage you to text GIVE1 to 94000. We also have these offering envelopes that you can drop off in the back. And then there's plenty of ways that you can uh, give online as well. But, but thank you for trusting us with that and allowing us to be a part of that process for you and your family. And so let's thank Brenda for her time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and then with that, uh, why don't you help me? Let's invite him to all stand back up because we're going to jump right back into worship. There we go. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Come on, stand to your feet as we continue to worship today. The song says this. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Darkness falls and won't prevail because the God I serve knows only how to triumph, and my God will never fail. Oh, no, my God will never fail. Cause I'm gonna see you, victory. Come on, help me say, I'm gonna see you.
morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on, if you believe we serve a victorious God. Thank you, Jesus. Because you won, we can walk in authority. We can walk in freedom. We're going to continue to worship this morning. He's so worthy. Just miracles, we can move. It's such an easy thing for you to do. And your hand is moving right now. And you are still showing up tomb of every Lazarus and your voice is calling me out right now I know you're able and my God so come through again cause you can do all things cause you No, you never lost the battle. you, God, for the name Jesus that's above every name. Every knee must bow and tongue profess to that name. We speak Jesus in the atmosphere. Just I 
Jesus. 
pray for us this morning. Thank you, God, that we can just declare the name Jesus, that there is power in your name. God, thank you. Your Bible says that in the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow that he is Lord, because there is power just in speaking that name. And so, God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of being able to call on you. God, thank you for knowing us. God, you know the things that happened yesterday. You know the things that are weighing on us today. God, you know the things that lie ahead for tomorrow. God, would you go before us? God, would you speak to our hearts today? You know what we're needing to hear today. Thank you for being an all-knowing God who loves us, who chases after us and pursues us. God, we love you. We give you today. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, you guys can be seated this morning. Oh, I feel like I just saw you a little bit ago. It's good to see you again. Uh, this is by far one of my favorite things that we get a chance to do. And for today, we we're get to, we're, we get to participate and experience child dedication. And it's so good for a couple reasons. I think if you look throughout scripture, uh, you see that God knows that we are forgetful people. And so we do a lot of things in scripture to mark moments and acknowledge um, what's happening. God went as far as to use piles of rocks to remind us about his faithfulness. And so in this one, similar to baptism, if you were here at Easter, we did baptism. Baptism is an individual choice for somebody to declare their faith. This is different in that this is the family's choice. And so it's parents and guardians and families together that are saying that to the best of our ability as, as families and as parents, we are going to raise these children in the way of Jesus, that we're going to raise them in a community, and we are so honored that, that, that they've chosen to do that here, and so we get a chance to do that. Now, there's going to be a, a part that you get to ex, uh, experience as well and participate in. That'll come at the end, but for now, we're going to go down and we get to meet each one of the families. Uh, we're going to meet the, the children or, or babies that we're dedicating. Uh, we picked out a word of what uh, their name means in Scripture, and then also given them a Scripture uh, to bless them with. And so we're going to do that, and then we'll get a chance to pray for them. So I'm going to come over here, and I get to meet. This is uh, the Jones family. So this is this little writer. How's it going, writer? We've been talking about his cool tattoos and things like that. We'll uh, save one of those for later. Deal. And then this is Nick and Haley. Writer, uh, your name means messenger of God. Did you know that? You didn't know that? Well, now you do, so that's good. And so I would like to read this over you. It says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of the Lord. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. And so Ryder, may you proclaim the name of the Lord in your life, in your actions, and in your words. Amen? Amen. So this, we've been working on this, so, but I'm so, they're so gracious. So uh, I'm going to introduce the family or the, the parents because we've got two little kids. We've got Jeremiah Gatiha and Ansley Curia, correct? Okay, good. And so we're going to start over here. This is Amelie and Jerry and Googie. Hi, how are you? Oh, she's good. I love that. So this is Amelie. And Amelie, did you know that your name means hardworking and industrious? You did? Okay, good. Well, then I'm, I'm glad that I got to tell them. And so with that, I thought that it was a very fitting to give you a, a, a scripture out of Proverbs. This is Proverbs 31, 25, and 26. It says, she is clothed with strength and di dignity. She can laugh all the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. And so may, absolutely, uh, may God bless you as a, as a woman of the Lord. May he bless you as his creation and may you shine brightly. So let's, let's give her a big hand. You're welcome. You're welcome. And then this sleepy little one over here. This is, this is Kian Geteha and Gugi. And Kian actually means grace of God. And so we gave you 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. And it says this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness, and therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, and in hardship, and persecution, and difficulties. For when I am weak, he is strong. And so may you, Kian, be the strength of the Lord. May you experience the grace of God, and may that be given to you now and in your life. 
Amen. Let's give them both a big hand. I'm going to move. Oh, okay, here we go. Abs. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's why we do this. This is great. This is Gianna, Gianna Abercrombie. How are you, sweetie? It's good to see you. And this is with Christopher Abercrombie and Genesis Andrade. <laughs> um, Gianna, for you. Oh, honey. I know. I get it. Uh, so Gianna, for you, is your name means God is gracious. God is gracious. And so for that, we chose Psalm 145, 8 and 9. And it says this, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And so may you not only experience the grace of God, but may you also be grace for others that they may see your grace that you give and bless others with it. Amen? Amen. You looked like you were reaching. You were reaching for this. You want to hold that? You want to hold that, honey? No, it's fine. It's fine. Hi, everybody. Hi. Okay. Huh? Oh, okay. No, we're not, we're not quite there yet. It's okay. So this is Aria Mae Blythe, and we've got Cameron and Janine Blythe, and also their son, Aiden. Hi, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. So Aria, or I'm sorry, oh, I'm so sorry, Aria. Uh, Aria, your, your name means song or medley. Did you know that? Isn't that fun? And so Ephesians 5, 19 says this. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make your music from the heart of the Lord. <laughs> Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May your life be a song. May it be a medley. And may you declare it. May God bless you richly. We are so grateful for you. Amen. Let's give her a big hand. Hi, guys. Hi. So, okay, so we are here. This is so. Uh, this is Sophia Ray Canella. And with Sophia Ray Canella, we've got the Canella family. We've got Valerie and Grandpa David. And then also Hannah. Or, I'm, sorry, I'm Sister Hannah. And so, uh, Sophia, your name means wisdom. So we wanted to give to you James 3.17, and it says this, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So Sophia, may you be a young lady, a woman of wisdom. May it be a gift that is given from God. When we ask for it, it's given. May you live that out for all to see. Amen? Amen. And then we have one other one right here. I am going to, uh, I'm going to hold the microphone and then we're going to pass off this one. This is... Okay, there you go. This is Caswell Frederick Payne and he's asleep, which is, yeah, I don't know if you can get a look at him. His name Caswell means a spring of water. This is Charlotte, Michael, and this is Baker. Baker, can you turn around and say hi to everybody? Yeah. So something that I've been trying to learn in my own life is to drink from the living water instead of going on my own strength. So what I pray for you, Caswell, in John 14, 4, this is Jesus speaking. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's what I hope for you, sweet Cassie. Love you, honey. So then, we have an opportunity. So here's the part that I love about this, is that in the highs and the lows and the bumps and the screams and the tears and all of it, is that we get a chance to be in this with you. And you need to know that we consider it an honor and a privilege. Thank you for trusting us with that. Thank you for taking these moments because it isn't just, it's about you as parents. And it is no, uh, parenting is no joke, as I'm sure you already know being up here. But more than that is that, if, that we have been designed to do this in community. And so we get an opportunity to say yes and amen to that as well. So I'm gonna invite you to stand up. There is a, a passage in the Old Testament that was written uh, and then read over. It's called the Shema. And what you're gonna see when I read this, it's a sense of, of that is that the Lord is to be with these families, these little ones and us at all times, which is no small task. 
And so then with that is that we just say, may the Lord be with you in all of that. And we in unison, in the unity of one body, say that we are with you in that as well. And so I'm gonna invite you to extend a hand. And a symbol of saying is that we can't understand everything that you're going through, but you're not doing this alone. And there's no magical force when we do this. It is just a sign of unity. And it's a sign of saying we are in this with you. And so allow me to read this for you and then we will pray. Deuteronomy 6, four through nine says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give to you are ought to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And so, Father, we give these, these little ones to you on behalf of their families. God, it is their heart's desire to raise them for you, by you, with you. And God, we recognize them as a gift, and so we will take care of them. God, thank you for the call that you've put on our lives to support them as well in that. It's no small task, but we trust you in all of it. God, would you bless these kids, bless these families richly. In your name we pray, all God's people said. Amen. Can you help me and give them one more big hand? God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Megan, why don't you go and, and, and head on out, out that way? So thank you. Guys, yeah, but here's what I'm going to say. As you're being seated, why don't you go and turn to somebody and say, hi, happy Sunday, and let them know the, your plans for the rest of the day, and then we're going to continue on in service. Today, we celebrate the women who've watched over us, taken care of us, and walked us through life. It's a day to say thank you to every mom. Moms with children running through the house, and moms whose kids are all grown up. Moms who are walking this road all by themselves, and moms who've loved a child in need moms who've suffered terrible loss, and moms whose children have become moms themselves. For all the times your love made our lives better, and the moments your lessons made our paths clear. For the way you showed us Jesus by simply being yourself, we say thank you. Whether today is a day of celebration reflection, or heartache. Know that you are loved. Mom, this day is for you. Happy Mother's Day. Moms are the best. We learn a lot from our moms. Um, I'm sure many of you have learned from a mother. <clears throat> um, I remember a um, story about Mary, she, uh, or no, Mandy, she had gone to her mom and said, you know, the big question, like, where, where did I come from? And mom, in her kindness, you know, prepared herself and was like, oh, man, this is it. Like, this is the big talk. And, you know, got out the white, like, the, the whole thing. I had to explain the whole thing. She's like, oh, I can't believe we're here. It's like the birds and the bees. And, and tells Mandy all of the stuff and finishes. And she's like, okay, we got through. Like, does that make sense? And, and she just said, well, Rebecca said she was from San Diego. So... Um, <laughs> But I thank you, Mom, so much for just making sure you get all the way in. You don't want to leave anything unpacked. Like, you want to make sure we're totally taken care of. <clears throat> it's awesome. Um, but I, I will say this, in, in all fun, there's also the seriousness of this. And I take this very seriously um, as I know many stories in the room are different for everyone. And this is one of those places, maybe even you're with us online today, um, because it's difficult to be here because you're carrying both celebration and joy about something, but at the same time, you're carrying grief or sorrow or mourning something. And so wherever you find yourself in that, I love the verse usually gives me comfort, Romans 12, 15, talks about um, celebrate with those who celebrate and mourn with those who mourn and the with part. So we're with you, um, wherever category you fall into and understand that that's like this little special superpower, I think, that we're given by the Holy Spirit to be able to carry both of those things at the same time. So um, yeah, 
there's that. Uh, a quick announcement before I hop back into the gospel according to Matthew. Um, in two weeks, uh, we're taking a break um, from going through the gospel according to Matthew. We're going to stop and do a 12-week pause, and we're going to have a conversation that we're calling Hope and Help. And these are mental health conversations. Uh, we believe that this is really important to have. And so wanted to give you plenty of heads up. You're going to be seeing stuff that's coming out about that. Uh, we're sharing what the topics are. This is uh, meant to be a really great resource for you where we can find hope and practical help as we are either personally working through our own mental health um, things that are going on, or we have friends and family. So this is also going to be a learning awareness um, some of our goal is to break down some of the stigma attached to that, or even with church. Um, and we are really investing into some um, smart, uh, certified people um, that we're learning from, that we're going to be learning from together as a community. And we're also making sure that we are resourcing you and tons of information about this. So in the next two weeks, we're going to be able to give you a lot of uh, resources and we'll have a page for that um, so that we, you can have this as kind of tools in your tool belt um, as we just continue to walk through and journey through life. So ultimately, what I want you to know <clears throat> is that um, whether this is something that you yourself are interested in just participating in, which I really hope and you should be, um, or you know someone, uh, we want to make sure so much that we're creating a space that's a grace-filled community um, that's safe to have these conversations as we unpack just the fragileness of some of those things. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be something really powerful. I think something uh, maybe bigger than we understand is going to come out of this and invite us maybe into some spaces we should be looking at stepping into in the way that we're caring for one another. Um, so in two weeks, uh, that's kicking off. Would love to have you here for that. So, But for now, we're um, almost done with Matthew chapter 21. Next week, we're going to finish that off before we take our pause. And so for today, um, we're in Matthew chapter 21. 21 started off. Jesus has gotten in Jerusalem. This is the final week. These are actually now the final days of his life. Um, and <clears throat> we're seeing how he has come into one of the busiest times of the year where there's like three times as many people that normally are there for the festival and the Passover and Jesus' interactions. And specifically, we're going to see uh, as he continues to have much more intense reactions um, with the, the chief um, elders and the priests um, and the way that they're engaging with one another. So let me read you this really large chunk of scripture, and then we'll, um, we'll break it up. So chapter 21, starting in verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or human origin? And they discussed it among themselves. And they said, well, if we say it's from heaven, he'll ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if we say it's from human origin... We're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first, they replied. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. Let's hop in. So right off the bat, we start off. And where are we at? We're at the temple. He's in the temple courts. And this is one of the last times that Jesus is going to be able to actually teach this way freely. 
before he's uh, arrested. And everything Jesus is going to do and everything he's going to say revolves around the temple because this has like been the confrontation that he's been having with the religious people and their hearts and their minds and their lives at the time. And the temple we have to understand, was the center of everything. Like it was the center of, of the thought life, of religious life, of behavior life. And so he's been, Jesus has been saying these crazy things, like religiously crazy things. And you have to understand that he chose the most important spot to do it. I mean, like it is on display. Not only has he been saying that this thing, the temple, the main thing is going to be destroyed and it's coming down, but that everything that it's meant up to this point in history, it no longer matters because it's being fulfilled in me, he's saying. That's literally what he does here. And this is what Jesus is doing. And this is this sacred spot for them. This was everything. And Jesus came and he wanted to replace two things that the temple was about. The first was the temple was about the presence. This is the presence of God on earth. And Jesus came and said, I now am the presence of God on earth. That's very important. The second thing is that this was a place where your sins were forgiven. Like you had to sacrifice grain or doves and animals. And this is where forgiveness of sin and the atonement, that it actually took place. And Jesus came and he said, I am now the presence of God on earth. And I am the one who forgives sin now. My life, my blood, meaning all of the ways of religion past are now over. This is done. I'm shutting it down. I am God. And I have come, I've shown up in the world and I'm giving my life for you. This is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And in the city, he's saying, this city that we're in right here is not big enough for the both of us because I am the temple now. Now here's what I think is a really beautiful part of this. Just this example and the way we see that Jesus lives his life is he just keeps coming back and saying the same things. He's, he's gracious enough to keep pushing in and coming back with the same point. And here's, Here's what I think the point is for us, is that we, we need God to do this for us, right? Like we need him to keep actually showing up and pushing in on us because we don't tend to listen the first time, do we? Like often you, when you think about it, it takes a handful of times for us to actually respond and be like, oh, I get it. You know, God, God has said like, hey, th you need to reorient your life this way. It's going to be better. And we're like, no, actually I'm smarter than you. Like I know how to live my life. Let me live my life, Right. And this whole passage really is going to function around this where, you know, God's coming in and he's saying like, hey, you're seeing these things. I'm showing you these things. I'm telling you these things. Here's how to do life. Here's how to do your sexuality. Here's how to do family. Here's how to do money. And you go like, no, I think I know like something a little bit more fun, a little better, right? And so he keeps showing up though. And he's challenging you over and over and over because I think it's really important for us to understand this because that's actually how gracious he is. And he just doesn't try once for us and then just move on like we often do. Isn't that what we like do? We're like, we have limits. And here's the beautiful thing about Jesus is he actually cares about your righteousness and about the righteousness of other people so much that he's willing to come back and keep trying. And that's what's so beautiful, even though we're hard hearted and stubborn, even though, you know, we keep doing our own thing, he keeps coming back, graciously coming back because he's so good, which really is, that's so abnormal for us because that's not what we do for other people. It, he, he wants to see a result in you. He wants to see a result in someone else. He, wa he wants people to figure out their, their righteousness, to actually grow in Christ. He wants you to put away your old ways. But he also understands us. He understands it's difficult for us because what we do is we tend to move towards our impulse. Have you noticed that? You moved much more towards impulse r rather than truth that's being spoken into you. And he keeps coming to us and saying, I have something better. Like, this is better for you, but I know you're going to keep doing whatever it is you're doing. You're going to go back to it because you're impulsive and you make decisions that way. Really, it's this idea of we're blinded by our feelings. How, how often can we find that we're blinded by our feelings or blinded by our gut? Because so often in life, we go with our gut rather than truth. You know, you can say, hey, this is the way you'll act. It will actually be better for you. And we can be like, well, my gut tells me this other thing. Rather than God has like shown up and said, here's what's reality. Here's how you should organize your life. And we say like, yeah, I'm going to do it this other way because it just feels 
good. And so Jesus here is showing up to these people. And he says, look it, your old ways are a mess. I want you to leave your old ways and I want you to replace them with different ways, not more boring ways, which by the way, haven't you realized like that's what a lot of people tend to hear? Like, if I'm going to give my life to Jesus, we, we tend to hear, like, you need to stop doing the things in your life and replace them with boring things. Like, become a Christian, right? Fun is over. Now your life is boring. <laughs> you don't do anything fun anymore. And some of you, that's why you haven't been interested in becoming a Christian or following Jesus, because you just want to do it your way. But Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up to the temple of your life, and, and he says, this thing in you right here, that needs to die, and you need, it needs to be destroyed, and you need to replace it with new ways of beings, like new hearts, new pleasures. And you're scared to move from over here to there in this life because he's coming up to each one of us telling you, I'm not just telling you to destroy something, replace it with something boring. I'm actually saying, let's replace it with something that brings you true life. Like, I'm going to replace it with something better. And, and here's what's naturally going to happen is the chief priests and the elders of your hearts and your minds are going to go like, no, reject it. Reject that. Whatever he's saying, what authority does he actually have to call that out in your life? Reject it. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you this authority? So that's what the chief priests and elders are doing. They're saying, whoa, 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 time out. You're coming here and teaching, and who made you boss? Now, it's good to understand, he has not been affirmed or ordained pastor or a rabbi at this time. These guys who were these um, Pharisees and Sadducees and the elders and the high priests, they'd gone through like all kinds of school and had been affirmed by rabbis. And that's not, not what Jesus had done. The, 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 the thing that we might ask right here is like, well, who, who are the elders? Who are these people? Who are the chief priests? Well, there's a high priest named Caiaphas. We're going to meet him in a couple chapters. He's kind of like the boss over the whole temple. He's the one who can get closest to God. Then you have chief priests, and they are the workers. Like, they they do the work of the temple, the cleaning and the maintenance and sacrifices, all that stuff. Then the elders, they're made up of a, a group of people that are basically like the judicial system, like the courts and stuff. And it's a group of Sadducees. And you'd say, well, what is a Sadducee? Well, that's a great question too. Um, they're like the Pharisees, except they're like the affluent ones. They're like a little upper class. They think they're better than they are. They've got the money. They've got, they're like in main town here. And there's a group of like 20 something to 70 something that are appointed as the elders, which then are kind of like this ruling group. So these guys have come here and says, who gave this guy authority? Like, where are the bosses? Like, who is this guy, um, you know, thinking he has the authority to say these things? And Jesus just comes out of the gate, and he's just like his own guy, right? So the question in their mind is, what, what authority do you have to even, like, be saying these things through? There's no way that you have the authority, you, Jesus of Nazareth, to walk in here and start calling this place down, calling judgment on here, calling things out that we have to live this new kind of life. There's no way that you have this. Now, some of us, um, when we're reading these things and learning about this, we have a tough time wrapping our head around why they would even question his authority because we've been following Jesus and we're like, I can't believe you didn't just accept him. I mean, look at all the things that he's done. Look at who he is. And so we can kind of scoff at this group that's questioning his authority. But here's the crazy part. You and I might have actually been the same because there's something that you and I love. One of the things that we love is good-looking people with power and influence. You and I, if you think about it, if you want to get right into the heart of it, we are obsessed with moving towards people with power and influence who are good-looking and pleasing to the eye. Those are the type of people that we want to follow. And what's interesting is Jesus has shown up. And we learn from Isaiah where Isaiah talks about there was nothing physical about him that was attractive to the point that if you're reading through the, the gospels, there was no gospel writer that even told us anything about what his physical appearance was. And so we can kind of become absent-minded that Jesus was a poor Middle Eastern Palestinian Jew. He was a poor guy. He came from other places. And what do we do we're like, I don't know if I want to follow the non-influential poor guy 
that just looks like a poor guy. I, we, so I got to paint a new picture. And so what have we done, especially in Western Christianity, right? What does Jesus look like? He's got blue piercing eyes. Like we're like, he had blue eyes for sure. And his hair care was on point, like the brown <laughs> flowing flocks, right? His beard was lined up and it had beard oil in it, right? Like a dimple, and like he could do the thing with his eyebrows and just like peer, like it was just like, oof, yes, I will follow that guy, right? It was Jesus, he had a six pack because he just was working out all the time, right? <clears throat> yeah. You've heard this in the past. People be like, who is that? And they would say, that's Jesus of Nazareth. And then what, what would we hear? People would follow up and be like, what good comes out of Nazareth? I mean, this is a poor place. Like, he was born in Bethlehem. That was a poverty-stricken place. Galilee, where he did much of his ministry, was for, like, dumb fishermen. And Jesus shows up to the temple in Jerusalem, and it's like university town. It's where all the cool people are from. And, and we learn <clears throat> from history and culture that where he grew up in that northern part of Israel, up there in Nazareth and the Galilee area, that people who were from that area had like an accent to their language, like a little twang, like you knew, kind of like, oh, you're from that area, right? You talk like this. Have you ever asked yourself, we're, we're having an honest day, have you ever judged someone by the way they looked or if it didn't look or the way that they spoke? Come on, we all been there. Like, you know, just the, the guy with an accent, and, well, no, you talk funny, you're different. Or <clears throat> one thing I can tell you right here in Benicia, I know who's like lived in Benicia their whole life. I know who's been here for not their whole life, and I know who's never been here, right? If you've lived here your whole life, you say it, Benicia. Where are you from? Benicia. You're like, where is Benicia, right? If you've been here for a shorter period of time, you live in Benicia or you're visiting Benicia, okay? Yeah, and if you've never been here, you're like, yeah, where's Benakaya? Like, you're just trying to, you know, you can just tell right off the bat. I know who, I know what, like, what category you fall in, right? I'm like, how often do we judge people by the way they look or they talk or the way that they don't look? You know how many times I've been in a space or a room and someone's introducing a pastor or something like that and, and it's always a person next to me like, oh, hey, pastor. And I'm like, <laughs> it's me. And they're like, oh, <laughs> shocking. And they're like, you look like you just got out of prison and ride a Harley. Like, you don't look the part right there, right? Like, that's what we do. We expect this. Like, this is all you're supposed to, you know, look the part, act the job. Come on, right? Or come on, who, <laughs> we're, we're unpacking all of it. Nobody even knew about Scientology until Tom Cruise started talking about it. And we're like, wow, look at the pretty guy. He's all influential. Let's check out this new thing, right? That's what we do. We like following powerful, influential people. And everyone, though, loves the humble guy that's like missing a tooth, right? We're all like, man. I actually want to love like that guy. But everybody then is going like, but I don't want to follow him. <laughs> I want to follow the guy that's like good looking. He's got the money, right? He's got the status. And, and that's why we're saying like, what authority? Like they're going, what authority? Like, come on, this is like a private club of people and elders and chief priests and leadership of theology and history. We don't need dumb guys here. Like you're coming in looking like this poor guy over here from Galilee and like everything in your background is like, we don't want to follow the dumb guy. So like, how do you get your authority? We want to follow not the humble guy. We want to follow the guy that's like a warrior looking guy with the, you know, their hair's wet, but they haven't even sweated, you know, riding a horse. You know exactly what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? And so the question for us in reality, if we get to the bottom of that stuff, by what authority does God get to take over your life? What kind of authority does that look like? And some, some of you, you haven't because you're like, I don't know if this is glamorous enough. I don't know if this is worth following. And this is a good sermon for you to hear because it's confrontational. Because it asks, what is the fundamental question about whether or not you're willing to be in control of your life? Which is why he said, oh, I'll ask you a question. If you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or human origin? Well, the reason that Jesus answers a question with a question um, is because if he just comes right out of the gate and says, yes, I am the Messiah, it, it, which is really what their question was, he'll be dead in a day. 
Like there's a subtle way um, that he's saying, like you're claiming to be Messiah, right? They're, they're, they're trying to like poke around us. It's kind of like a detective. Like if a detective comes onto a murder scene, they don't just walk up to somebody who's the suspect and say like, did you murder them? They don't do that. They'd be like, hey, where were you at eight o'clock last night? What were you up to? Oh, what kind of car do you drive, right? Trying to catch them in mistake. And this is what they're doing right here to Jesus. Now, the reason he just doesn't say yes again is because if he does this, there's things that he needs to get done. They're still teaching that needs to happen. He'll be dead in a day. He's got more to do, more to say. And so he says, let me ask you a question. You riddle me this. I'll riddle you back. And he throws it back at them, which, by the way, is a very uh, rabbinical um, way of teaching. Like this is how rabbis taught one another. And it was, a lot of things were answering a question with a question to unpack it. So he says, where... Where is the baptism of John the Baptist? Where does that come from? Heaven or man? And he's saying this because to them very specifically because he was baptized by John the Baptist. And it was actually then that was the outlining of his authority and his anointing in this messiahship by the Holy Spirit. This is when it happened. And people loved John. And they recognized him as an Old Testament prophet, a kind of the climatic last Old Testament prophet. And so he asked them, did you accept John? Because if you accept him, then you accept me. Because John had even said this about me. Look, the lamb of God, I am, unholy, I, I am unworthy to even tie his sandals. This guy is better than me. So you're questioning my authority. Let me ask you then, what do you think about John the Baptist? And so then they knew they got stuck. Now they're like, oh, let's huddle up and kind of go over this. And they discuss amongst themselves. And we say from heaven, he's going to ask, why didn't you believe them? Because they had rejected John. But if we say human origin... Right here, here's the one. We say human origin. We are afraid of the people, for they will all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know. They're afraid of the crowd. They're afraid of the crowd. And just as a side for a second, you and I, as we think of our freedom and authority, don't be afraid of the crowd because the crowd is so often wrong. Like the crowd doesn't even know what the crowd thinks. And we can think that we know what the crowd wants and what it desires. And in the end, the crowd does not care about you. Let me say this to my high school and middle school students sitting in here. I actually have one of both in here and I want them to hear this as well. When your friends want to be sending you, you know, like dirty, nasty pictures of each other or when they want to like gossip or like they want to like tag somebody else in something or they want to talk poorly about another individual or they're saying like, oh, everyone's doing this. You should be vaping this or come to this crazy thing, right? There is a time. There is a time that you get to recognize that the crowd makes you think everyone else is doing it, but they are just as afraid as you are. And they're also just as afraid of what the crowd uh, accepts in them. There's a time when you actually have to gain power through the fact that you are kicking against the grain and you get to choose to kick against the grain because you are the Rocky in the fight. You are the underdog in this culture and you are the David in the David and Goliath era. And you need to actually go, I don't want to go with the crowd especially with how loud the crowd is in the culture today. In adults, we just did child dedications. We need to set that example of what, as well of what it looks like to not always just go with the crowd. I mean, like adults, if you think about this, after our years of maturity and knowledge, how sad and cowardly is it that you and I will still go with the crowd? We'll still go right along with it. Where in our lives are we bending a knee to the crowd? In what rooms are we not standing up and saying like, yeah, we're actually not going to gossip about that person and tear them down? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to go and participate in that thing because I value my relationship over here and what this is going to say. Where are we bending a knee to the crowd? And furthermore, it sets an example for our young people that they also don't have to bend a knee to the crowd. Moving on. There you go. So they answered Jesus. We don't know because they're afraid of the crowd. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. So he's told them without telling them. You see this, right? Like, and if we can decode it, he's saying, I am the Messiah, but I'm not going to say that I'm the Messiah, because then you're going to peg it on me, and I'm not going to be able to finish this work. And so 
Then he does this. Listen, then he gives a parable. And this is really important. It's really the same. It's the same exact point. He asks him, so what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first son and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two sons did what his father wanted? The first They answered, Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness. He came to show you and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you didn't repent and believe him. So this is what I'm going to do with a little teeny bit of time that I have left. We're going to do this. This is self-evaluation. What brother are you? Which brother are you? And here's what the church, unfortunately, at times can be full of. It can be full of people in the second category who see, say immediately to God, like, yes, I can go, and I'm going to do that, but don't. They come to church, they tie their money, they listen to Christian radio stations, they say really quickly, yes, Father, I'll do this, yes, and sound righteousness, like, yeah, I'm going to hold back some of my anger. Oh, I'm going to be kind to people, I'm going to think of other people. But at the end of the day, they don't do the will of the Father. They don't go out into the field. They don't actually believe and obey. All they do is believe. That's scary, that you believe, but you don't obey. You're the wrong brother. You believe the right doctrine, the right theology, the right dogma. Uh, Yes, Father, I will go in the field. It sounds great. You know, like, look at that guy's life. He's so Christian. But in reality, you don't do the will of the Father in your life. It's much like what we talked about last week, where you're all leaves and no fruit. Like you're putting on a show, but nothing's happening. But then there's this other group, this like messed up, prostitute, tax collector that goes, I don't want to do the will of God. I don't care about God. I'm, not, I, I'm trying to figure this out. But in their brokenness, behind closed doors, they do the will of God. And this is why I love Northgate so much because it's filled with messed up people. Like you're a disaster. Like you're a wreck. Your life is a wreck. I know you. I, I, I do. <laughs> I've seen some things, right? And that's a good thing. Why? Because you have to be a people who depend on the grace of God. God, thank you for your grace. And when we're messed up like we are, we have no other choice than to depend on the grace of God. That the people who were in in the end are the people who didn't look like they were at the beginning. Because they were the skeptics. They were the ones who said, no, Father, I don't want to go into the field. And our church is full of these people. I meet people here all of the time that say, you don't understand that my life was a wreck. I never thought that I could go into church. And then I showed up and I met a bunch of people just like me, only living underneath the grace of Jesus and not underneath the righteousness of ourselves. And there's freedom in it. That's the point of this. There's freedom in it. Jesus says, you take me as your authority, then you get truly free. Free in a way that you could have never imagined. And my heart, my hope, is that we are a church of individuals who not only believe the right things and say the right things and look the right way, but we actually do the will of the Father. And so let's represent the Father by how we're living this out so that we can become a place where we get to represent the good news of the gospel to those thought to be left out. So let me pray to that end. God, I want to confess to you and just create some space for all of us to confess to you. What are the things, what are the, the things that are in my life, the temples, the idols in my life that you need to have authority over, that you need to tear down? Would you just expose that to me? But God, would you be so kind? gracious to me as you show me those those things that need to shift so I can inherit and participate in the better that you know for me as a good father. Would you care for my friends? Would your spirit move in this place and care for my friends in this room today as we confess or you expose those things to us? 
lead with your gentleness and your kindness and your grace and your mercy and your love as we try so desperately hard to surrender that over to you. You are the authority in this room right now. It's all yours. You're in control. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, would you stand and respond in worship?
Isaiah 53 says it like this. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. May we be a people that seek and find that Jesus, the sacrificial Jesus, the Jesus who, as God sent through time and space, to become not only our Savior, but our friend. So we invite you, wherever you're at in that journey, we would have the, uh, it would be a privilege to, to join you in that and to help you take a next step. If you have a first step that you need to take, if you're at a place of saying, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, but I'd love to know more about this Jesus that you talk about, because I've heard a lot about Jesus, but maybe not like this, maybe not like what I see in Scripture. We have our, our This Changes Everything journal, which walks through in 21 days what it would look like to say yes to Jesus and take a first step. And we'd love to send that to you if you're joining us online, and so you can text us, and we can get that information out to you. Or we have an area out in the lobby called This Changes Everything. Because we believe that by saying yes to Jesus, your entire life has changed and it's the best decision you can make. So we'd love to give you one of those. And then for all of us, is that we would love to be able to also just pray with you. And so we recognize that as life comes on, on you, it's, it's heavy and it's difficult. And it's instructed in scripture is that we are to carry each other's burdens and we wanna do that through prayer. And so you can text prayer one to 94,000. We have prayer stations in the back and people to pray with you. And then also um, other people out in the lobby who would love to join you in all those things that you're carrying because we recognize that whether it's a season or this day or what you're heading into is that we wanna, we wanna be able to not only pray for you now, but as we head through that and know that as God meets you in those things, those those prayer requests, those stories then become celebrations and a testimony that you declare to other people. And then finally, I'd love to send you out with a blessing. And so we invite you to put out your hands in a sign of receiving. Earlier, we, we told you to put them out like this. Now we invite you to put them out like this. And may the Lord bless you with his presence and give you strength and courage to represent Jesus and represent him to those in need. God bless you. Have a great Mother's Day. Celebrate well. We'll see you next week.